There are four key steps to a successful woodworking project. Purchasing your material, preparing your material, doing your joinery, and applying a finish. We're going to cover those first two items in this video. You know, when you go out to buy plywood or hardwood, there are a number of choices. You have to understand cores, terms like rotary cut, plain sliced, grades, how many quarters the material is. It can be very confusing. We're going to help you understand what all those items are so that when you purchase, you're making a wise choice. We're going to show you how to break down that material so you get the most yield and best appearance for the parts for your project. So let's look at some examples. An attractive woodworking project doesn't happen by accident. Careful selection of the parts is essential. For example, let's look at this valet with the two matching drawer faces. The material was cut from one board so that the grain ran across. It adds real drama. The top of this nightstand was carefully selected so it almost looks like it came from one board. On this jewelry chest, we prepared the material for the fronts from one block of wood. We did all of our joinery and cutting and then separated it into three pieces so the grain and the curl flows across the project. On this jewelry box, we selected material for the front that probably would have been thrown away. We resawed it, glued it back together, and created a gorgeous panel. When building this glass display table, we used one board and mitered it to create a frame and the grain flows all the way around. On this server, all the material was very carefully selected to have uniform grain structure. The drawers come from one board. We've looked at how important it is to select hardwood for your project, but plywood is also key. In this nightstand, we selected a cabinet grade material and carefully centered the grain within the frame. It adds real drama. In a more utilitarian piece, we selected materials available from the home center with rotary cut plywood. It was less expensive, but also yields a successful project. So let's look at some of the tips and techniques we use at Wood Magazine that you can use in your shop. We prefer to buy our material in the rough, random width and length. That means when I go to the mill, I don't know how wide the stock or how long the stock's gonna be, but I do know how thick it is gonna be if I have a couple understandings of what material is available. This is four quarter stock. It's four quarters of an inch thick, but there are a lot more choices than that. Here are some samples of eight quarter, six quarter, five quarter, and four quarter material. As you can see, eight quarters is two inches thick, eight quarters of an inch. But here are my different options. What I yield from this material is, for example, Here's a piece of four quarter that I've run through the joiner and planer and now it's seven eighths of an inch thick. If I went to the home center, it's going to be three quarters of an inch thick. So here I've lost a full quarter inch of material that, I'm, that I can't take advantage of anymore. But with material that's this nice, I can make a seven eighths inch tabletop. Just that little extra thickness takes advantage of the options as a custom woodworker that we get to do. But what do I yield from the different thicknesses? Well, in eight quarter stock, and I get an inch and seven eighths inch, let's say, table leg, versus an inch and a half material that I might be able to purchase at the home center. You know, this gives me a lot more design options. You know, when I go to put a taper on that leg, by the time I leave a small section down here for the foot, I don't have a lot that I can taper and it doesn't give me a lot of choices. This material, being a lot thicker, if I put the same size base, I've got a lot more material that I can create more drama in how the leg is shaped. Here's an example of what other options I might have. I can have the mill prepare some of the stock in advance. Let's say I need drawer material. I typically make my drawers half inch thick. That means I can have them plane it to five eighths of an inch. Let them carry, get rid of all the planer shavings and, and do a lot of the hard work for me. But it, with it being 5 8 I can still take advantage of the joiner and planer and get this material flat and true so my joinery is precise. 
This material would be considered S3S. It's surfaced on two sides and jointed on one edge. So three sides are finished, one side's rough. You can even see the mill marks here. All of this material comes in a couple different options. I might get it skip planed, I might get it rough sawn, or S3S. You'll often, sometimes you'll hear, even hear, hear this referred to as S4S when you pick up from the home center. Whenever you purchase material, you need to also plan that you're going to lose a little bit off each end. For example, with this piece of eight quarter that I bought, I had to cut about an inch and a half off the end because of cross-checking. This is a result of the drying process. But you may find checking and, and cupping and, 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 and cracks in the ends of the S4S material you bought at the home center. So you're going to lose material either way, but just be aware of it. You can't always gain, guarantee that you, out of an eight foot board, you're going to yield eight foot of material. Plywood comes in a couple different configurations. There's veneer core, the very traditional way of buying plywood, or MDF core, medium density fiberboard. There's some advantages and disadvantages with both materials. When I'm purchasing material, I'm buying it based on the grade of the faces. So in, in this example, A1 is, has an A side. It could be an A, B, C, or D on one side. The second side are numbered, one, two, three, four. So an A1, meaning it has a really good face, A side, and the one is pretty good. This would probably be the inside of the cabinet. This would be the outside. You can also get material all the way down to say an A4, where it might be oak on one side, it may be luon on the other. So kind of watch your materials when you're purchasing them. Other options that are available are, uh, there is also a material called architectural sequential match and numbered. What that means is when you buy five sheets, those are all numbered so that the veneer on all five sheets looks almost identical. It's sequentially cut from the tree. So if you were putting paneling up, they're going to all match. When I'm purchasing the core, there's a couple options. I can buy veneer core made up of different layers of material in un uneven numbers so that the material is balanced. Or MDF core composite fiberboard with a veneer on both sides. There's some advantages and disadvantages. Structurally, this is much stronger but the MDF lays a lot flatter. If there's a, if there's a void in this top layer of veneer or the material right underneath the top veneer, that may telegraph through the surface. With the fiberboard material, the top is going to be perfectly flat. It's also going to be very heavy, almost 25 or 30 pounds heavier than the veneer core. I like to buy combination core plywood. You pay a little bit more for it, but you get the advantages of veneer core and the fact of its screw holding ability, but the advantage of MDF core in the fact that they use a layer of MDF just under the top veneer, and that way the material is super flat. It's my choice when I'm purchasing material. There's one other type of veneer, veneered material that I buy. It's called Baltic birch plywood is the old name. You might hear it referred to as finish ply or apple ply, but basically it's a larger number of veneers stacked together and there's almost no voids in it. This also comes with different faces, A and what they're referred to as AA, BB. There's all different types of options when you're buying Baltic birch, but one of the key advantages when I'm making something for the shop I can just sand the edges real smooth and it looks nice. I don't have to put edging on everything. For this jewelry box, I had to purchase my material from a couple different sources. It has plywood on the back. I picked that up at the home center. The cherry for it, I just got at my local mill. It's a domestic hardwood and most places are going to have it. But for the bird's eye maple that's on the top, I had to buy that online. I just did an online search for bird's eye maple and found a place that sold it online. Easy enough. That's not quite, doesn't quite cover everything. We've got all our different combination core and different thicknesses of material. 
I typically buy plywood from a cabinet supplier or a lumber, lumber wholesaler. That's where the cabinet shops are buying their material. They have the A1 plywoods. You're going to pay probably more than double for an architectural grade plywood than you are than buying oak plywood at the home center, but you're getting a lot nicer looking material. Where it's less expensive at the home center to buy plywood and you're buy, paying more at the home center, I'm paying six dollars bo per board foot for this oak versus two and a half dollars a board foot. So there's pluses and minuses when you're buying materials from a variety of sources. One other thing to consider is what grades of hardwood and plywood are available. I can buy select number one, number two, different grades of hardwood, but it really doesn't matter. What's going to matter is that's what the supplier has. I can't go in and demand one grade when they have another because they're not going to be able to help me. So being flexible in what you buy is part of the part of the process of working on your projects. You know, I call I make up a material list before I go to the home center or to the lumber mill of what all my materials are and then I make a phone call. I find out what they might or might not have and how much the material is and off I go. But I also take this with me so that I can write on the boards what I'm going to use it for. Um, you know, for example, a blanket chest here, um, I may decide when I get there that the mahogany looks really nice and build the project out of mahogany when I get there. It might be a little more expensive, but it might be something that's going to make the project look better. So be flexible. So I'm going to make a couple phone calls, find out what I can find from my supplier, and get some oak for a blanket chest. I went to my lumber supplier and I picked up 50 board feet of red oak for a project. How did I figure that and what's a board foot? Well, a board foot is one square foot of material, one foot wide, one foot long. It may be six inches wide and two foot long, but it's one board foot of material, one inch thick. If I'm buying material that's six quarter, it's going to be, for example, a 12 inch wide board, 12 inches long. It, since it's an inch and a half thick, it's one and a half board foot. So I pay, and I pay a premium for that thicker material. So eight quarter stock may end up costing, not only am I paying double for the surface area, but I'm also going to be paying a higher premium for that material. Now, I bought 50 board foot. I typically uh, calculate that I need about 25% waste. Now, with materials like walnut, with when it has a lot of knots, um, I'll, I'll raise that percentage, maybe even up to 40%. So sometimes the, the more expensive material may not just be in the cost of the material itself, but the waste factor. Um, so based on what I calculated, I bought 50 board foot. That leaves me a little extra. Heck, I can use it for some other projects. I've set my boards up so I can start selecting them based on the grain direction and color. Also, I've got my metal detector, and so while they're here, I can scan each board to make sure there's not a stray bullet or maybe a piece of barbed wire fence that was in the board. It'd be very dangerous to send the material through the planer with a piece of barbed wire fence in there. All my material is kiln dried. It's running at about 8%, 8, 5 to 8% moisture content. And really, you may want to invest in a, a, a moisture meter, but really only if you're buying air dried stock. For example, this piece of walnut, it's running about 14% moisture. That's air dried. It was never put through a kiln to get all the moisture out. I'll want to let this sit in my shop and acclimate for maybe a month before I use it. If it's too moist, it's going to shrink too much and I won't be able to control what happens in my project. A board going from say 15% to 8% moisture content when it's, when it's finally going to settle into say your living room, um, a 24 inch wide board may shrink as much as 7 eighths of an inch. So you'll have to be careful about the stock. So then you may want to invest in a moisture meter. So I'm going to sort out my boards and figure out what I'm going to use for the front and the sides of my blanket chest. They're going to be the biggest pieces. So I always select like drawer faces or, 
or the panels and a raised panel door, I'll select that material first because those are the big real estate areas. So I want to make sure I take advantage of the wide stock before I, then I'll figure out all the small parts afterwards. So now I'm going to lay out the front and the sides of my blanket chest. They're going to be the pieces that are most visible and eat up most of the boards in the project. So I've got two sides that are 18 inches long and the front that's 44. I'll typically add two to three inches to each one of those lengths to make sure that I get enough to cut the panel square and true it up. I've also laid out my stock so that I have the narrow grain running on the edge of each board and the cathedral open grain in the middle of each board so that the grain direction matches pretty close. It'll end up looking more natural than having real abrupt grain changes. So I'll find any grain that I like and I don't like what's going on here so maybe I'll draw, use my some piece of chalk. Yep. And we'll come down I've got a knot here, so I'll shift that down. And here you'll see I'll need to find another board to use here, but it won't be that difficult to match. What this will allow is, for the most part, for the grain to wrap around the, three, the front and both ends of the chest, and the, that'll make the piece look really nice. Use a circular saw to break the boards down to rough lengths, cutting along the chalk marks. You don't have to be exact. All the ends will get squared up once the paint glued together. This is why I marked each piece a couple of inches long. Keep the pieces organized as you cut them. In just a minute, I'll show you how I mark them to keep things straight. Now I've got nine different pieces of lumber here I need to kind of wrangle, it's like, a, like herding cats. So I just put the part letter on each one. I'm not worried about up and down yet. I just want to make sure that I know, for example, this will be the side, which is part B, and I'll put a one, two, three, and a line, and a line. So I'll know how these parts are going to go back together so that I can keep this board in line with this board as we work around our project. I'll continue that for the rest of the material. I've got my material prep and I'm ready to start machining this stock. But before I do, I want to talk about the kind of debate of do I need a joiner or a planer? I believe you need both, and here's why. When you run a board through a planer, it makes things parallel to each other. So if I run a board that has a twist to it, as I run it through the planer, the board will twist as it goes through, making the top surface and the bottom surface parallel, but not flat. That's what my joiner is going to do. A lot of people use the joiner for what I think is they're missing the, the biggest advantage of a joiner is that they're not flattening their stock. They're only truing up one edge. I took some material that was three quarters of an inch thick, just over a three quarter, and milled it to three quarter through the planer to show exactly what happens. I ripped the stock to two inches wide and pocket screwed it together. When I put the joint together, I clamped them as tight as I could to line all the surfaces. Now, I didn't flatten that board, and here's what I get. I'm almost a quarter of an inch high in this corner when I hold down this edge. That is going to be very difficult to hang this door. 
If you're running into problems where things aren't coming together square, a lot of it can be brought back to the squareness of the stock that we're working with. Believe me, square material cut true and properly will, will improve your woodworking a, more than you can imagine. Another example is, here's a couple boards that I've shown before. They have a little cup to them. I've clamped them together so that the joint is right on the money. I tighten one end, tighten the other, clamped it up, and you'll see it is not flat. Now this might work for a small, say, end table top where I can, where I can secure it down to, a, to the table base, but if it's warped and twisted bad enough, it actually could twist the frame of the table. And if I'm gluing up several boards, I'm going to have joints come together and it's going to be very difficult to align all the joints at every location along the panel for those joints to come out properly. I'll have to end up belt sanding and it'll take a ton of work. We're going to go through a process here where doing things step by step, we're going to result in panels that glue up very easily and lay very flat. You also notice I haven't really worried about the width of my boards. As long as they're wider than the 16 inches I'm after, I've just allowed for the extra material of how wide these boards are. I could almost not quite get it out of two boards, so I needed a third. I will start removing material from each edge and flattening these boards. Now, these boards are almost eight inches wide, and they are not going to go through my six inch joiner. So the first thing I need to do is take the material and make it so that everything's safe to use on the joiner. So we'll go to the table saw first. I've set my ta table saw fence to about five and a half inches. Five and a half, five and three quarter is about all I can really expect to get across a six inch joiner. There'll be an irregular surface, so if there's a little bow to the board, um, I'm not going to be able to gain full six inches. So I've set it, I'll rip and be very careful about how I orientate every board as I'm doing this so everything gets put back right where it came from. I've rearranged all the boards here on my bench back to their original position and now all my boards have a oh, relatively straight edge but not good enough to glue together. So I'm going to go to the joiner, I'm going to flatten the bottom face and square up one edge so it'll be flat and square each one of these boards. I'll only do the bottom and the, the table saw on edge. Before I do any machining, I want to make sure I understand how to run material across here safely and take advantage of the material so that I'm not fighting it. Okay, first thing is the way this board is oriented, the grain is actually running down towards the bottom and back so that when the teeth are coming around, they're pulling with the grain. So the first thing I want to do is flatten it with the grain running towards the ground where my feet are standing. I'm going to put, use two push sticks. I try not to close my hands through and grip. I want to make sure my hands are open because if something slips, I can let go. I'm looking for, to make sure I've gotten everything flat. It's going to take one more pass. With the bottom cleaned up, now I need to take and square up one edge. Now remember, I've got to take that flat surface and you take advantage of the square fence. But I also need to pay attention to the grain direction up here. This is pretty parallel. So it's safe to run, a, this could run across either way, but again, I gotta make sure I'm up against the fence. But I want, again, the same thing, the grain direction would be going towards the floor where I'm standing if I've got some grain issues. Otherwise, I'll get some bad tear out. that'll leave me a square edge. You'll notice that when I push the material across, 
I got my hand away from the area above the knives and then came back and really I'm applying pressure to keep this edge of the board true to the fence and really I, it's all a matter of keeping everything in contact right past the blade. That's the most critical part of the joiner. So this board is faced on the bottom and jointed on the edge, and it would be ready to go to the planer. So let's get our other stock all prepared. I'm always looking to see how much of the surface is flat. I don't have to have it perfectly flat. If there's a couple small spaces, I can still go to the planer. I want to take advantage of the full thickness of that material. So if I totally flatten this, by the time I flatten this edge, the top surface, and then come back to clean up this, um, I'll maximize the material. But if I take everything finally off here, everything over here, I may actually end up with a thinner board. Now that we have all the bottoms flat and one edge true, I'm going to go to the planer. That will make the top surface parallel to that perfectly flat bottom. Much like the joiner, I need to watch my grain orientation. The blades are spinning around like this. What I don't want is my grain pointing up because it will lift and cause tear out. What I want is the grain to be running like this so as it lifts the material, it's lifting with the grain. So I need to flip this board around so the grain is moving up and so will the knives and it will keep from getting tear out. I'll set the blade to take off about a 32nd of an inch. I made the tops parallel to the bottom and I've cleaned up any leftover skip marks from the joiner. So now all my material is parallel top and bottom and, and true on one edge. Now I just want to go through and just make sure that I have everything back in its proper orientation. Now I want to clean up and start thinking about that other edge. I also need to think about my clamp up strategy to make sure that I can put things through my 13 inch planer or whatever planer width you have. I can't glue this all up in one shot and run it through the planer. I've left the material thicker than my final dimension. In fact, this material, I'm just 1 32nd shy of 7 8 of an inch. So looking at what I have left, I have 12 inches with these three boards and 7 and a half over here. So that'll run through the planer and that will run through the planer. So I'm going to glue these two up and this. But first, like I said, I need to make sure everything is straight and parallel. I've got all my boards flat, cut on 90 degrees on one edge, and cut 90 degrees on the other edge. Everything's ready to glue up. Now there's one final check I want to make. I've got a knot over here, and I've got some light wood here. This is actually sap wood. It's right near the, uh, the bark of the tree. And, and color-wise, it's not going to look very good. I want to look to make sure I've got even color and grain orientation going across. And actually, what's really nice is I haven't worried about how wide, oh, I've got a 5-inch, five 5-inch, five and 5-inch five wide board to get uniform. What I've done is I've created grain patterns that run across the joint line so that the width of the boards really aren't evident. But I've got this sap. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this board end for end. I don't like that. I don't like that. That's not bad. The discoloration goes away. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to rip a little bit off this board. I've cut that sap wood out. And that grain runs pretty good. So I'll need to remember that and make an adjustment on my next panel so that I get the grain wrap. The other thing I can do is flip this over, but I think I'm just fine where it was. Now for this knot, as long as I've got 16 inches, which is what I'm really after, 
I'm okay with this knot. I'll include it because I'll want to clean up any edging and true up any, any spots. If I had a gap in a board, I may need to go back to the joiner, depending on the quality of my rip blade. Um, they say that some blades are joint quality. Um, that can be true, but I still like to run the boards across the, that sawn edge across the joiner to make sure they're perfectly square and perfectly flat. I've set up my clamps so that I'm about 8 to 10 inches apart, and I've also set them slightly wider than the panel that I'm going to glue up. So I'll transfer my boards over one at a time, keeping them in their proper orientation, and we'll apply some glue. We'll let the glue dry for three or four hours. We'll get this other set clamped up, and when they're both ready to go, we'll run them through the planer. Now you might be tempted to go ahead and remove the glue, but if I use a wet rag to remove this, it's going to dilute the glue and put it into the grain structure and may cause difficulty in staining later. So I don't want to do that. What I want to do is I want to let it sit for maybe 45 minutes. It'll, the glue will get rigid enough that I'll just be able to scrape it off. And I can use a card scraper. I can actually use a credit card just to shear it off. So here we are, our panel's back in its original orientation. And what I need to do now is I'm going to run both these two pan separate panels through the surface planer to the final dimension I'm after. Now, the real reason that I want to do this is if I would have glued this all up in one time, I would have had one, two, three, four different glue joints that I had to all deal with and, and worry about sanding smooth. What this is going to do is allow these two glue joints and this glue joint over here to totally be taken out of the picture. The planer will do the work for us, and all I have to focus on is getting one glue joint to look good in that three-quarter dimension. And then I should be able to just, with a random orbit sander, clean this panel up, and it should be complete. So I'll go to the planer, and we'll plane it down to our final thickness. So we've completed gluing up our panel, we've removed any glue, and we're ready to finalize the dimensions of the part. What I want to do is eliminate any defects or maybe the fact that this piece is the least appealing of the, of the pieces that are glued up. I really like this part. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut this off first. So I'll measure the width to maximize what I can get, and I'll set my saw. If my cut has removed all of the knot, which it has, I can now trim the panel to its final width. To cut the part to its length, I'll use a crosscut sled. It's just made from some half-inch plywood, a runner, and a backer block. I'm going to cut the marked end first, and you'll see why. Now, I can put some tape across the project. And mark it just like it came off. With that removed, I can trim the panel to the length by flipping it over. What I want to make sure is, since I use this as my reference edge on the cutoff sled, I always want to just flip it over to make sure that my angles are consistent from one side to the end. I know that I've ripped it parallel, but it's just a, a good practice. And now we've got a great looking panel that we can incorporate into our project. You can't always get the stock you want. 
Sometimes you may not find the species in the thickness you're after. For example, if I couldn't find the eight quarter oak I was wanting to make some uh, inch and a half or almost two inch square legs, I might have to use four quarter and, and laminate the material to come up to the final thickness. Or if I wanted to make some three and a half inch big like dining table legs, I might use eight quarter and fold it over thicker lamination. The advantage of using a wider piece and folding it over, you'll see a book matched edge on that jointed face once we get done. We'll show you that in a minute, but let's see how we get there and you'll see the reward pay off in the end. First, rip the blank in half, then true up one face of each half. Next, I plane the opposite face to bring the pieces to just over half the finished thickness of the leg. Then, I rip them to final width. Now, I could just randomly have two boards and it'll look pretty good. But if I put them back the way they came, I create a book match. And when I glue that up, you'll never be able to tell there's a glue line. The other advantage is now I have a block of wood that's three and a half inches square with this beautiful joint and I'll use it on the visible face and the joint that's not as nice after I run it through the planer and true it all up I'll use on the back side of the leg but I would have never been able to come up with a joint that looks a board that looks this nice using four different pieces of material if we're making doors the way to make them very stable and the most appealing is to make it like a picture frame. Make the styles and the rails have very straight grain so that the eye is not distracted. You wouldn't want the grain running off the direction over here and this one running maybe the same direction. The door might look crooked. So if I use straight grain on the perimeter, then I can use the wider cathedral grain, much like this rough panel for the center in here. So I'm going to make a raised panel door similar to this but with solid wood and raised detail. So how do I go about making all these parts? Well let's get this out of our way and focus on the door, the door panel. I have found some stock that was wide enough to make my door panel out of and using the same process I'll rip this into two parts so that there's the proper size to go through my machines. I will join them, edge them, plane them, glue it up, and plane it to its final thickness like we did with our blanket chest side. That's the easy part. Now I need to make the rails with all that and styles with all that straight grain. So what I've done is I've just made out of a piece of cardboard a pattern so that I can find the straightest grain on this board that's got grain going every direction. So I can use a Sharpie marker, that'll be the easiest way to make everybody see what I've got going on here. And just by setting it on here, I can see how that part might turn out. So I'll come over to the edge, and I notice there's a little discoloration here, so I want to get out of that. So I'll come in and, and get the grain going as straight as possible. And sometimes I'll follow a grain line, and I'll see it comes maybe a quarter inch from here, shift it over a little bit. So there's one part. Now what I'll do is I can either use a jigsaw or a bandsaw and cut these parts out. Now what I've drawn is the parts to their final dimension, so I just want to make sure I cut outside the line and now I've got a rough sawn blank much like I've done with my other material, and I'll treat it the same. I'll join it and square it up, I'll plane them and rip them to their final width. With my grain selected, the parts jointed and planed, I can see the straight grain of the perimeter styles and rails and the cathedral grain of the panel will turn into a nice door. I'll cut the joinery and show you the results a little later. When you're building those projects with wide glue ups, and you really want that cathedral grain or that central grain to be right in the middle of the panel, there's a couple alternatives we have. Yeah, we can buy those big wide 
pieces, but that's not always an option. We can buy thicker, buy eight quarter stock, and take it to the bandsaw, cut it down the middle, open it up, and you get a great pattern. This is called book matching. Here, this is a piece of ash. One thing with, that you'll note is that when you bandsaw it, and you'll plane it, the grain pattern may shift a little bit. I like to cut my pieces a couple extra inches long, and then I can shift the board up or down to get the, as much of the grain structure to match as possible. Those panels could be resawn again to make a wider panel. It would be thinner, but if, that's what, if that will suit the need of our project, that may be a way to go. Here's just a couple pieces of veneer. It's the same thing with plywood. It was cut open to be book matched. The next piece can be folded and unfolded through a series of cuts, and we get a very consistent pattern across a project. It's another way that you can use the natural beauty of wood to enhance your woodworking project. The way that lumber grades are determined is how big of parts I can yield out of a larger plank. For example, I can get a nice piece right here and remove all the knots. Sometimes though, even though I may be able to get that material out of here, I, by the time I plane it down, because there's so much twisting, for example, that might be in a board, that by the time I join it and plane it down, some of the areas may not have all the mill marks removed. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut, instead of cutting, say, a 60-inch board to get three drawer faces out of, I'm going to cut three 20-inch pieces in a row. I'll mark them and index them so that I can keep them in line as I go through my milling procedure. It will allow me to yield more parts out of lower grade material. So let's see how I would go about making up those drawer faces. This board's pretty flat, but I still have the knots to deal with. So the first place I'm going to go is right to this knot. I'm going to move just a couple inches away to the grain straightens back out and draw a line on each side. Now I'm going to see what I can yield. I need 20 inch long drawer fronts, so hmm, I think I can get, yep, I can get a couple on this side. but I run into a knot on this direction. Hmm, is that gonna work for me? Normally I would say no, but remember we're talking about drawer faces. Do you ever see the inside of the drawer face? Well, you might if it's on a drawer with a detached face, you know, where you have a drawer box and a separate front. When you put them together, you'll never see that inside area. Maybe I can use that to my advantage. When I flip the board over, the knot's gone. So, yeah, I will use that. The one thing I'll have to be careful of, when I'm going to use this, this surface on the jointer first. That way I can get this flat, I'll machine this face parallel, I'll have both sides be my consistent thickness, and then I'll take off the bad material through the planer the rest of the way down, yielding, trying to keep this side intact. I don't know how deep this knot is, so I'll have to watch for it in my machining process. Remember that nice piece of walnut I showed you earlier? It's air dried, it's absolutely gorgeous, but how do I take advantage of all the different things that are going on? The grain is all over the board. Well, I'm going to start at one end. Here I've got some nice straight grain structure that I can make rails and styles out of that will look really nice. This part of the board has some big wide cathedral grain and it would make a great drawer front or maybe the side of a cabinet that has a raised panel. Coming down this way, I've got some sap wood that I need to get rid of and I've got structure of grain that's kind of moving around and I have this big defect. So how do I take advantage of this area? Well, let's say I'm making a little dresser with an arched rail at the bottom. I can use that grain to my advantage. And by placing that window over the project, I can search around until I find just the right grain structure. I've got a nice little area here. Oh, that one's real nice. I've got this grain line 
that really follows my arch. So I'll mark that out and utilize that section. Now this defect here, this is really a tricky area. I can always go to the bandsaw and cut a section out, but what if I want to get a, a straight section right here next to this knot and the split? This is going to be dangerous to run across the joiner because the board will be unstable and it would be unsafe to run through the table saw. So I can use a scrap of plywood and what I can do is overhang the edge, drive a couple of screws, and now putting this edge up against my rip fence, I can rip parallel edge right off this board safely and accurately. Working with plywood presents some of the same challenges we dealt with when dealing with hardwood. We want to maximize the effect of the grain and take advantage of it for our use in our project. But it presents some other challenges. The material is large and heavy, sometimes more than 100 pounds a sheet, and can be very difficult and unsafe to handle through a table saw. So how do I deal with those challenges? The first thing I do is I think about the grain structure. You know, we can buy rotary cut plywood, like here in this door panel. It's great for a shop cabinet. Rotary cut plywood, the veneer is peeled off the outside of a log. And it's, it lays out and it creates a very irregular grain pattern. But it makes great cabinet material for my shop. Slip matched or plain sliced plywood takes the plywood and cuts slices through the tree that creates structure in the grain that looks just like parts of a hardwood log that has been cut up and edge glued into a piece of plywood. Here I can take advantage of a joint line in the plywood to create some real drama using that plywood to my best effect in my project. So if I have a large sheet I need to select a grain pattern that I like for the part. Let's say I'm going to make a 12 inch wide, 6 foot long side for a bookcase. The first thing I need to do is figure out how wide I need to make my first rip based on the grain. But I also want to make sure I don't use the factory edge for my finished piece. So what I'll do is I'll cut the part about a half inch wider than I need it. And I'll take advantage of the table saw to true it up. So I'll cut it 12 and a half inches wide on the floor and then we'll go to the table saw and I'll show you how I clean it up and size it to its final dimensions safely. To break down the sheet, the first thing I do is I get a piece of inch and a half rigid insulation. I've cut it about four inches smaller in both directions than my sheet and you'll see why. So I'll bring my sheet in and lay it on the foam. Now I can start selecting the grain and making the cuts using a circular saw and a couple of edge guides. The edge of the side starts about 10 inches from the edge. After marking both edges, I align my cutoff jig with one set of marks. To make a cutoff jig, just glue and screw a narrow strip of MDF to a second strip the width of your circular saw's shoe. Then run the saw against the narrow strip, trimming the wider one. Now, the edge of the jig shows exactly where the blade will cut. I like to use a 40 tooth finish blade to reduce chip out and set the depth of cut just deeper than the plywood thickness. You don't want to cut into the floor. A framing square helps me set the jig for cross cutting the pieces to rough length. This doesn't have to be perfect. I'll true up the end on the table saw. I keep that four inch strip of foam that I took off the long edge of the plywood as a straight edge, a lightweight straight edge, to set my outfeed support. I set it slightly below the surface of the table so if the material drops a little bit, it doesn't catch. Now I've got two pieces that are identically sized and I've maximized my grain potential within that sheet of plywood. We've covered a lot of ground today including this door that I promised you. I did all the joinery and put it together so you can see the careful selection of grain for the styles and rails and the panel and the result you get. One other tip, 
when I'm edge gluing panels, I always try to keep a scrap of what I've left over. If I was to screw this panel into position and needed to counter bore and plug the holes, I can get the plugs out of this offcut. Remember those first two parts of making a successful project? Purchasing your material and preparing your material. I hope you have a better understanding of the material choices that are out there so you're making wise purchasing decisions. And also that you're using and preparing your stock flat, square and true, and picking the best material for the best application for your project. Using wide panels, book matching, running grain across multiple parts, it's all a part of creating a successful project. Now take these tips and techniques and apply them to the projects in your shop. Come visit us at woodmagazine.com for more tips, techniques, and projects, and be safe in your shop.